Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Sri Lanka remains a cover story. The emergency has been revoked, but the situation is only worsening. Dire warnings are being made. Sri Lankans are on the brink of starvation. The Sri Lankan rupee has become the worst performing currency in the world. The president is refusing to resign. Today, he's lost a major support base, the powerful Buddhist monks of Sri Lanka. The ones who brought the Rajapaksas to power, they now say that the brothers must go. It's a significant setback. The public sentiment is already against them. The protests are growing by the day and China seems to have left the Rajapaksas in the lurch. Some interesting comments in the Chinese state media on the governments of both Sri Lanka and Pakistan, in fact. Leaders who went out of their way to accommodate China, they're now being dumped in their hour of crisis. On Gravitas tonight, we'll discuss all of this and more. In recent days, we've witnessed a stunning reversal in Sri Lanka. The all-powerful Rajapaksas have been humbled. They're losing power with every passing day. First, the cabinet quit. Then, the new finance minister resigned. Then, the Rajapaksas lost majority in parliament. And today, they suffered another major setback. The powerful monks of Sri Lanka are turning against the Rajapaksas. And these are the, the very same monks who helped them win the election. Now, they want them to quit. Is this the end of the road for the ruling family of Sri Lanka or will they be able to brazen it out? In the next five minutes, we'll discuss, first of all, the situation on the ground. The protests are growing bigger by the day. Today, doctors hit the streets. They say they're helpless. There is a serious shortage of medicines in Sri Lankan hospitals and these doctors have issued a warning. They say Sri Lanka could face a major health disaster next. Yeah, we identified high vital drug science shortage and 189 essential drug science shortage. So we are to face impending health disaster situation. One month ago, when the inflation came into our country, the government has increased the prices of all the pharmaceuticals by 30%. So that has uh, caused a severe burden on the people. Lives are at risk. There's a huge shortage of drugs. Sri Lanka, in fact, imports 85% of its medicines. And now he doesn't have the money to pay for them. Doctors say a health emergency should be declared. Protesters say the Rajapaksas must quit. That President Gotabaya Rajapaksa should resign. His brother, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa, must go too. As the pressure mounts, the brothers made a concession today. President Gotabaya Rajapaksa has revoked the emergency. It was declared on Friday, remember, last Friday. And this is a U-turn if there ever was. Why was the emergency declared in the first place and why has it been revoked now? What has changed in the last five days? The Rajapaksa wanted to, Paksa brothers, they wanted to contain the protests. So they declared an emergency because it gives more powers to security forces. They can use any means to crush the protests. Tear gas, water cannons, violent crackdowns, arrests without warrants. They've tried everything and they've failed. The crowds are growing. If anything, the emergency has made the situation worse. So now they're withdrawing it to save face. And I'll tell you why it will not work. The people of Sri Lanka want food and medicines. How does revoking the emergency help them? Today, the Sri Lankan rupee became the world's worst performing currency. This could have serious consequences. The Sri Lankan parliament met today. The speaker issued a warning. And I have that quote with me. This is what the, sh the speaker said in the parliament today. We are told this is the worst crisis, but I think this is just the beginning. The food, gas and electricity shortages will get worse. There will be very acute food shortages and starvation. 
That's what it has come down to. Sri Lankans on the brink of starvation. But the president will not give up power. Gotabaya Rajapaksa has refused to step down. His party's chief whip said as much in parliament today. He said Gotabaya Rajapaksa will not resign under quote-unquote any circumstances. So who can force his hand? The Buddhist monks of Sri Lanka, a very powerful political group with a lot of influence, they are, unha they are unhappy and they're spelling it out. They want President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to quit. And this message comes from the highest ranking Buddhist monks, the ones who oversee and regulate the Buddhist clergy in Sri Lanka. And I have that statement with me too. This is what it says. During the past two and a half years, the incumbent government has ruined the country to its end, destroyed democracy, the country's supremacy of the law, sold national assets. Very important statement. The country has been colonized. The country's money has been misused and foreign exchange has been misused as well. People know everything. This is a major setback for the Rajapaksas. The monks, remember, propelled them to power. Now they want them out. Theravada Buddhism is the official religion of this country. More than 70% of the population practices it. It is also the biggest vote bank. In the 2019 election, these monks openly campaigned for the Rajapaksas. One of the major supporters was the Bodhu Balasena. This group had appealed to all 100,000 Buddhist temples in the country. They'd said that the clergy should create a Sinhala government. In other words, they'd said that Buddhists should vote for the Rajapaksas. And the Bodhu Balasena is the most hardline and radical of groups in Sri Lanka. And that's a story for another day. In the present situation, I must say, religion is not really a factor. People from all religions are suffering and they're all protesting against the government. But criticism from the monks deals a body blow to the authority of the Rajapaksas. Then we have nuns and priests taking to the streets, 700 of them. They carried out a solidarity march and they too questioned the government. Our corrupt leaders must be sensitive to the cry of the people now. What is unbelievable is that there is this insensitivity among our corrupt political leaders. How could people be so insensitive when people are crying out for basic human needs like electricity, like gas, like milk powder, like diesel and petrol? This insensitivity must be crushed. So for how long can the Rajapaksas ignore such appeals? How long can they continue in office? They neither have the numbers nor popular support. This is a minority government presiding over a humanitarian crisis, struggling to stay in power and losing its grip every day. And talking about struggles to stay in power, we also have Pakistan. It's a tragic comedy, you could say. The script writes itself. The country remains on the edge, the parliament stands dissolved, the prime minister remains defined, the opposition remains offensive and the judiciary remains sluggish. Today the Supreme Court of Pakistan held another hearing, another session to determine Imran Khan's fate. It was supposed to rule on the legality of the political manoeuvres. The court was supposed to decide whether the dissolution of the Pakistan Assembly was constitutional or not. What do you think the court said? Not today. That essentially was what they said. They adjourned the matter yet again, next hearing on Thursday morning. And remember, this is the fourth adjournment in four days. Why is the court doing this? What is it up to? Critics say it's up to no good. That it's deliberately delaying the case to buy opposition, the opposition more time. Others say it's waiting for instructions from the army. And both sound like plausible possibilities when it comes to Pakistan. What about Imran Khan? What is he up to? Well, he's holding rallies. He's drumming up support for snap elections. On Tuesday, he said, if the elections do take place, the PTI will bury the political careers of its opponents. Listen to this. election, we will learn a sabak from all the people who were the part of this country and who have given the government of Pakistan जो एक खुदार गवर्नमेंट है जो एक आजाद फॉरेन पॉलिसी मुल्क की चाहती है उसको इन्होंने गिराने की जो कोशिश की है इंशाल्लाह पाकिस्तान की عوام आने वाले इलेक्शन में इनको वो सबक सिखाएगी कि इन ये सियासत सिर्फ ये इलेक्शन हारेंगे नहीं 
ان کی سیاست کی قبر بنے گی ہمیشہ کے لیے ختم ہوگی He wants the people to punish those who conspired against him, those who he says are part of an alleged foreign plot to oust him. Do the people of Pakistan agree with this? Do they even believe there's a foreign conspiracy? Well, they do not. Between the 3rd and the 4th of April, Gallup Pakistan held a survey. It asked Pakistani citizens why the opposition was trying to oust Imran Khan. Do you know what they said? More than 64% of these respondents said it was because of inflation. Only 36% blamed a foreign conspiracy. And this was not the only question. The survey also asked people if they were satisfied with Imran Khan's performance. Only 43% said yes. More than 57% said they were not satisfied. So put it, to put it simply, Imran Khan may not have the popular support that he claims to have. And come elections, there's no guarantee that the PTI will win. Imran Khan's associates have sensed this. They've realized that his days may be numbered. So they're fleeing Pakistan with all they have. Reports say in the last few days, a number of Imran Khan's close aides and family friends have left the country. Why? Because they fear they will be arrested once he is removed from power. Among those who fled is a certain Farah Khan, a close friend of Imran Khan's wife, Bushra Bibi. The opposition says she was Imran Khan's front woman for corruption. That's the term they use. That she would take huge sums of money from officers and this was bribed to get them the postings or transfers they wanted. The opposition says Farah Khan has fled Islamabad with billions of Pakistani rupees. And they've shared a picture of her on board a private jet on her way to Dubai. A lot of them focusing on that luxury bag apparently worth 90,000 US dollars. Now let me say this, these are all claims by the opposition. We've not been able to independently verify them. The Pakistani media is reporting all of this. In fact, they can't seem to get enough of this story. They're chasing PTI ministers for answers. At a recent press conference in Islamabad, Chaudhary Fawad Hussain was asked about this story and he did not take this too kindly. He began heckling the journalist who asked him the question. You have to watch this. Commando sir, Commando sir, one statement of facts that today Raja Azam has been gathered. And on that, this has happened. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. No, 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 अच्छा जी स्टेटमेंट ऑफ़ फैक्स पहले आज बजे जवाब में होगा स्टेटमेंट ऑफ़ फैक्स आपने जमा कराई है ये कराय पे आते हैं लोग इस तरह के स्टेटमेंट ऑफ़ फैक्स जो है वो हमने किया है और हमने ये बात कही है I said it was a tragic comedy. Perhaps he forgot that he's no longer in the government. The country's assembly remains dissolved. Fawad Chaudhary should have known this. After all, information and broadcasting was his domain. Now, do you know what both Sri Lanka and Pakistan have in common? Other than rulers who failed miserably, they have the China connection. Just think about it. You have Imran Khan in Pakistan and the Rajapaksas in Sri Lanka. They both borrowed heavily from China. They bet on Chinese investments. They praised Xi Jinping. Basically, they made a deal with the devil. And as usual, the devil doesn't care. China has abandoned both Imran Khan and the Rajapaksas. Protests, public outrage, constitutional crisis. China doesn't care. They have left both allies high and dry. We'll start with Sri Lanka. Xi Jinping sold the Chinese dream to Colombo. Massive ports, stunning highways, plus something to sweeten the deal for the Rajapaksas. And the result is this. Sri Lanka owes $3.5 billion to China. For Beijing, it is mission accomplished. They forced Sri Lanka to lease the Humban Tota port. They trapped Colombo in their notorious debt trap, but they forgot to consider one thing, the public response. The Sri Lankan people want to topple Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Now, more than ever, he needs China's help. But China is nowhere in the picture. Officially, they've not said a thing. 
Not even a single comment on the situation in Sri Lanka. What's more, they're refusing any sort of help. First, Sri Lanka asked China to restructure their debt. China refused. Then they asked China for a $2.5 billion financial package. This was two weeks back, and China is yet to respond. Their only official reaction has been this, an alert from the Chinese embassy in Colombo. They're asking Chinese citizens to take precautions, to be vigilant. And just think about the double standards here. The same China did not evacuate its people when Russia invaded Ukraine. They kept their embassy open when the Taliban took Kabul. But in Sri Lanka, they're suddenly proactive. What explains this difference? China knows it is complicit in Sri Lanka's collapse. They know the Lankan public is against them, so they have changed strategy. Their new plan has two parts. Number one, dump the Rajapaksas. And number two, distance themselves from the crisis. Take a look at an article by the Global Times. In fact, I have some quotes from there. I'll read out a few lines for you. This is what it says. Sri Lanka's economic crisis has been years in the making. The direct cause is the COVID-19 pandemic. Sri Lanka's domestic economy has not been transformed and upgraded since the recovery from the civil war. Unfortunately, the government has not seized the change the chance to restructure Sri Lanka's economy and put forward large-scale reforms. Let me translate that for you. What's happening in Sri Lanka is the government's fault. It is the pandemic's fault. China's debt trap has nothing to do with it. That is what Beijing wants us to believe. And it's not just Sri Lanka. China is doing the same thing to Imran Khan, their iron brother, their favorite vassal. Think of everything that Imran Khan did for them. Sold his country's land to Chinese investors, picked China over the United States, gave Xi Jinping a free pass on Xinjiang. He even invited Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, to the recent OIC summit. And what does he get in return? Absolutely nothing. Officially, China is silent on Pakistan as well. Not even a single comment. But if you think about it, this was China's dream scenario. They keep accusing the U.S. of foreign interference. Now you have a Pakistani prime minister saying the exact same thing. So logically, they should support Imran Khan. Even the Russian foreign ministry is backing him. So why is China silent? Because they are hedging their bets. Again, let's look at the Global Times. Here is what their article says, and I'm quoting. Experts cited several reasons that have led to the current political situation in Pakistan, including serious political infighting and poor economic development. And of course, as Khan mentioned, some external forces. External forces is almost an afterthought. This ambivalence is due to one reason. The Pakistani army, the Chinese may not believe in principles or morals, but they do understand politics. In Pakistan, the army calls the shots. It's amply clear. If you want to do business in Islamabad, you need the army. Prime ministers will come and go. The army stays. And right now, the army is not backing Imran Khan. In fact, they're not backing China either. Listen to what Pakistan Army Chief Kamar Javed Bajwa said last week. We are not looking for camp politics. We had historically excellent regime in the United States. The good army that today we have is largely built and trained by the United States. The best equipment that we have is the American equipment. We still have uh, deep cooperation with the United States and our Western friends. I'll repeat what the general said. The best equipment we have is the US equipment. Now compare that to Chinese tech. The Pakistani army has consistently complained about them, the tanks, the artillery, all of it. So the Pakistan army is not ready to abandon the West which means China had to make a call, stick their neck out and support Imran Khan or sit out the crisis. China being China chose the safer option. They need the army's help in Afghanistan, even in Balochistan, which is at the heart of CPEC. Imran Khan cannot guarantee any of that. The army can. And both these betrayals are a larger message to the world. China does not care about your people. They do not care about economic growth. They're only concerned with strategic games. And when things go south, the Chinese will be the first to leave. Now, caution, concern, and now condemnation. Three Cs. That's how India's policy on Ukraine has evolved. When the war was brewing, it was caution. When the war broke out, it was concern. And now, as war crimes emerge, it is condemnation. Let's begin with what happened on Tuesday. The United Nations Security Council was convened again. 
Just one thing was on the agenda, the brutal killings in Bucha. Once again, there was no consensus. The West accused Russia of a massacre, of killing civilians. Russia called the entire thing staged. Then it was India's turn to speak. Ambassador Tirumurthy condemned the massacre in Bucha. He called for an independent investigation, but he stopped short of naming Russia. Listen to this. Recent reports of civilian killings in Bucha are deeply disturbing. We unequivocally condemn these killings and support the call for an independent investigation. The rest of it was as expected. Talks, humanitarian assistance and upholding the UN Charter. These have been India's consistent demands. But let's focus on the condemnation. Yes, India did not name Russia, but the message was quite clear. Neutrality is not a free pass for war crimes. And by the way, this was India's strongest statement on Ukraine yet. Not concern or caution. This was condemnation. So do we see this as a strategic rethink by India? Well, not really. Foreign Minister Jay Shankar spoke in Parliament today and he once again spelled out India's position. He said if India has picked any side, it is the side of peace. In this day and age, dialogue and diplomacy are the right answers to any disputes. And this should bear in mind that the contemporary global order has been built on the UN Charter, on respect for international law, and for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states. If India has chosen a side, it is a side of peace. And it is for an immediate end to violence. It was a long address by the foreign minister, almost an hour long, but it basically boiled down to two things. Number one, protecting India's national interest. And number two, playing a positive role during the war. And positive role doesn't just mean neutrality. It also means humanitarian support. It means plugging supply shortages. Minister Jay Shankar did speak out about this. He says India will step up export of essential items. We will also step forward where global demands for food, grains uh, and other materials are concerned. And we will do it without, in a, in a manner that is helpful to the global economy, which will not take undue advantage of countries in distress. Washington would have seen all of this, the condemnation, the evolution of India's position, all of it. The question is, how do they perceive it? As India joining their camp, or is India standing up against war crimes? How do they see it? Until now, their strategy has been quite confusing, frankly. Last week, we had a U.S. official threatening India. Hours later, the State Department had to step in. On Tuesday, there was more confusion from Washington, D.C., courtesy Pentagon Chief Lloyd Austin. He was asked about India's military cooperation with Russia. You should listen to Austin's response. Well, we continue to work with, uh, with them to ensure that... Uh, uh, they understand that, uh, you know, it's not in their best, we believe that it's not in their best interest to continue to invest uh, in Russian equipment. And, and our requirement going forward is that, uh, you know, they, uh, they downscale uh, the types of equipment that they're investing in uh, and, uh, and look to invest more in the types of things that will make us uh, continue to be compatible. Three problems here. Number one, India decides India's best interests. It is not for the Pentagon to believe or assess what is good for India. Number two, did you hear the part of Austin's uh, statement? Our requirement going forward is that India downscale the types of equipment they're investing in. Again, the same attitude. How can India's defense purchases be based on America's quote-unquote requirement? And number three, there is no admission of historic responsibility. For instance, why does India buy Russian weapons at all? Why is India's arsenal filled with Soviet inventory? The answer lies in America's hostile attitude during the Cold War. Nobody in Washington is willing to talk about that. All of these issues will come to the fore on the 11th of April. That's next Monday. That's when India and America will hold their 2 plus 2 dialogue. We've talked about this format before. 2 plus 2 basically means two ministers from the United States and two ministers from India. 2 plus 2. They meet. 
In this format, it is the foreign and defense ministers. The last round was held in New Delhi, so this time S.J. Shankar, the foreign minister of India, and Rajnath Singh, the defense minister of India, are flying to Washington, D.C. And ahead of this meeting, Jay Shankar spoke to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. This was their second phone call in seven days. Naturally, this, the focus was on Ukraine. Both sides agreed to remain closely coordinated on the war. And this phone call is a precursor to the two plus two. Not necessarily a good precursor because both sides have very different demands. America will look to test India's commitment, possibly push for public criticism of Russia's war. India, meanwhile, has more pressing priorities. China, for instance, the Indo-Pacific, Afghanistan. These issues will be more important for India. In simple words, America will want to discuss more of Russia and India will want to keep Russia to the minimum. It promises to be a tricky summit next week. The joint statement will be the one to watch out for. For the moment, we're turning to France. It's election season there. The presidential race is underway. We've been telling you about this. The first round of voting is on Sunday. The second round will be held on April 24th. Now, with just, just a few days left, the campaigns are getting more and more polarizing. This week, anti-Semitism has taken center stage. The death of a Jewish man has turned into a political battle in France. President Emmanuel Macron's rivals say he's not doing enough to contain anti-Semitism. They say hate crimes against Jews have risen during his tenure. Is there truth to these claims? Our next report has some answers and numbers. This was Jeremy Cohen, 31-year-old observant Jew. A resident of the Bobigny commune in Paris. Two months back, he died in what police deemed a traffic accident. The headlines suggested he was run over by a tram. Turns out that wasn't the case. This footage has been released by Cohen's family. It shows the moments leading to his death. In the video, the victim is seen being attacked by a mob. He then runs onto the street to escape them, but collides with an incoming tram. He was evacuated to a nearby hospital. He succumbed to his wounds. Cohen's family claims the police lied to them about the cause of death. They're calling his death a case of hate crime against Jews. The prosecutors maintain the attack was not discriminatory. The statements collected so far do not show that the attack was committed for discriminatory reasons. There is no evidence to date to establish with certainty that the victim was wearing a yarmulke at the time, whether or not it was apparent. But the family's efforts have worked. They have reopened the investigation, also ignited a political battle. You see, France is in election mode. The voting begins in four days, and the candidates are seizing on this crime for political points. They say it shows the rise of anti-Semitism under Emmanuel Macron. Leading the charge is Eric Zemmour, a far-right presidential candidate. He was the first to raise this issue on social media. He even wrote an opinion piece, arguing that the case showed the poisoned cocktail of contemporary France. The National Front's Marie Le Pen has made a similar charge. She says the crime was covered up by French authorities and that this shows the rise of savagery in France. Both Le Pen and Zemmour have put the onus on Emmanuel Macron. They say his policies are behind the rise of anti-Jewish sentiments in France. Macron has refuted these allegations. He has ordered what he calls a transparent probe and accused his rivals of political manipulation. First of all, I salute the spirit of responsibility of both the parents and the lawyer. I think that human tragedies occur every day and they must not give rise to political manipulation, whatever it may be. The justice system and the police must work together. In recent years, France has witnessed a number of anti-Semitic attacks. 
In 2017, 311 incidents were reported. In 2018, the figure rose to 541. In 2019, it rose to 687. The figure declined considerably after the onset of the pandemic, but in 2021 it increased again with 589 hate crimes being reported. A report by a Jewish watchdog says at least 70% of French Jews have been victims of at least one hate crime. 64% have suffered anti-Semitic verbal abuse, 23% have been targets of physical violence, and 10% have been attacked more than once. So the issue is serious, the politics around it, not really. Macron's rivals who accuse him of not doing enough have themselves been guilty of promoting anti-Semitism. India woke up to more bad news today. Oil prices had increased once again by another 80 paise. That's $0.011. Doesn't sound like very much. 80 paise is an insignificant price hike. Well, yes and no. An 80 paise price hike may seem insignificant if seen independently. But it is substantial when repeated day after day. This is the 14th price hike in 16 days. 14th hike in the last 16 days. Do the math. In India, petrol prices have gone up by 10 rupees in the last 16 days. It all began on the 22nd of March. Before that, petrol in New Delhi was over 95 rupees a litre. Diesel nearly 87 rupees. In Mumbai, petrol was selling at almost 110 rupees a litre. Diesel around 94 rupees. Now look at the current prices. Petrol has crossed 105 rupees in Delhi, 120 in Mumbai, diesel over 96 rupees in Delhi, almost 105 rupees in Mumbai. What explains this rise? The war in Ukraine, that's what the government has said. And with good reason. Brent crude hit a record high because of the war. The day Russia invaded Ukraine, Brent crude shot up to $105 a barrel. Soon it became $139. Today it's trading at $107 a barrel. Basics first, what's a barrel? 59, 159 litres approximately. What is Brent crude? It is a global price benchmark for crude oil. If global prices go up, India is bound to be affected. That's because India imports nearly 85% of its oil. So when Brent crude prices go up, prices of petrol and diesel in India also go up. This time Brent crude has gone up because of the war. So Indians are paying more for petrol and diesel. And so far in the story, the villain is the Ukraine war. Or you could say the villain is Russia for starting the war. Consumers the world over are suffering. In the US, petrol is over a dollar per litre. In the UK, more than two dollars. In France, nearly two dollars. China, 1.47 dollars. Israel, above two dollars. Same with Germany, 1.96 dollars. In Spain, just above 1.5 dollars. In Canada. The war in Ukraine has affected the prices of other commodities too, cooking oil for example, or wheat. But crude oil tops the chart. Today, an average Indian consumer is paying 4,200 rupees or $56 to fill a standard 40-litre fuel tank. And the government of India says, Indians are in a better position compared to the rest of the world. So petrol by, I think, 9 rupees over 12 or 13 days, when the international prices shot up. Now, I have something, sir. Gasoline at the pump comparison between April 21 and April, March 22, in USA the increase percentage is 51%. In Canada, 52%. In Germany, 55%. UK, 55%. France, 50%. Spain, 58%. Sri Lanka, 55%. India, sir, 5%. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Here's another. Yes, prices in the US have gone up 50%. But how much would Americans pay for fuel on a normal day? During the pandemic, Americans were paying as little as $1.94 for a gallon of petrol. One gallon is 3.76 liters. That's around $0.5 for one liter of petrol. You see, during the pandemic, Brent crude had fallen to $18.38 a barrel. It was a record low. But that did not reflect in India. Fuel prices did not plummet in India. Indian consumers never reap the benefits of the global price fall. 
Do you know why? Because the government of India increased excise duty. That's tax on oil. Let's look at the breakup of an oil bill in India. On the 1st of this month, the 1st of April, Delhi was paying 101.81 rupees for one litre of oil. Out of this, the base price was just 53 rupees. The rest was mostly tax. Today, tax makes up nearly 43% of the fuel total price in New Delhi. In the US, tax makes up only 25% of the total oil bill. That's what makes the difference. When oil prices came down during the pandemic, India increased excise. By how much? 10 rupees per litre on petrol, 13 rupees per litre on diesel. This was in May 2020. The government said the money would be used for infrastructure and other development. Now, oil tax is a big source of revenue for the government, both state and union. The union government earned 3.36 lakh crores in 2021 from excise on petrol, diesel and natural gas. That's approximately $44.32 billion. In 2020, the number was 2.03 lakh crores over $26 billion. Recently, India's oil minister defended the high excise. He reportedly said the money earned funds other initiatives, free meals, for example, or cooking gas or COVID-19 vaccines. So here's what it has come down to. Indian consumers must pay hefty sums for petrol even when prices are down globally. And when prices go up, the consumers must expect no relief. What's more, they must also be prepared to pay more for other commodities because as oil prices soar, so does the bill for fruits, vegetables, grocery, airfare, cabs, everything. The government has passed the buck to oil companies. It says oil prices are decontrolled, meaning the oil companies are the ones who decide the price, not the government. And that's a fact. Prices are decided by oil companies. Taxes are decided by governments. So for the consumer, there's no relief. When prices of crude grow, go up, oil companies pass the bill to the consumer. When prices fall, the government rakes in extra revenue. So that's government one, oil companies one, and consumers zero. And talking about zero-sum games, there was another one last week. A virtual summit between China and the European Union. Frankly, it skipped below our radar. Most people did not even realize that this summit happened. And now we know why, because it... It was a complete waste of time, to put it simply. Nothing remotely positive came out of it. And I know this is a harsh assessment, but wait till you hear what Europe's top diplomats said about the very same summit. This was not exactly a dialogue, he said. Maybe a dialogue of the deaf. China wanted to set aside our differences on Ukraine. They did not want to talk about human rights and other stuff. Harsh words there. But here's a question for the European Union. What else did you expect? This is day 42 of Russia's invasion. China still calls it a special military operation, not an invasion. They continue to sidestep Western sanctions. Expecting anything else is wishful thinking. Nonetheless, the EU tried. Of course, we expect China as a member of the Security Council of the United Nations to take its responsibilities. There are few members only, and they have a vast responsibility. And China has an influence on Russia. And therefore, we expect China to take its responsibility to end this war and uh, to come back, that Russia comes back to a peaceful negotiations solution. Like I said, wishful thinking. China was never going to discuss Ukraine. They wanted just two things, more investments from Europe and more access to European markets. On sanctions, there was no commitment. China is not a related party on the the crisis of Ukraine, and we don't think our normal trade with any other country should be affected. Even Europe have been conducting your normal business uh, with uh, Russians. You haven't stopped all your trade with Russians. And so our normal trade with Moscow should not be affected because the employment and the living standards of China are also dependent on the normal trade with all the countries, including uh, Russia. He's right about one thing. Lectures and sanctions are a bit rich coming from Europe. They continue to buy Russian gas worth billions of dollars. Having said that, this summit is a wake-up call for both China and the European Union. For China, it's a sneak peek into the future. Beijing wants to dehyphenate Ukraine and everything else. It wants to support Russia. Even Putin, help Putin, in fact, circumvent sanctions. And at the same time, keep doing business as usual. That's what they wanted from this summit too. Keep Ukraine aside and discuss trade. 
This time at least, Europe did not agree. But Brussels did make a mistake. They were planning to discuss human rights with China to win China over to the Western camp. This shows how naive they are. You cannot discuss rights with China. You need actions. Unfortunately, Europe has failed to do that. Take any issue, the war in Ukraine or the unofficial blockade on Lithuania, Europe's response has been inadequate. And this statement by the EU president is proof of that. We discussed that and also the fact that no European citizen would understand any support to Russia's ability to wage war. Moreover, it would lead to a major reputational, reputational damage for China here in Europe. Reputational damage. Well, that is Europe's big threat. China has jailed thousands of Uyghurs in labor camps. They're crushing democracy in Hong Kong. They're threatening sovereign nations in the South China Sea. Do you think reputation is China's big concern? I know we said nothing positive came out from this summit, but scratch that. Something positive did come out. The gulf between the West and China, it has been revealed. The West is still holding a candle for Beijing, hoping they will join the campaign against Russia. So in reality, this was not a dialogue of the deaf. This was a dialogue of the willfully ignorant. And this divide between the West and the East is only set to grow. Here's another reason why. A new weapons race is underway. Western powers on one side, China and Russia on the other. These two blocks are competing against each other. They want hypersonic weapons and they want them fast. These are missiles that travel faster than sound. Russia says it is already using them in Ukraine. Now AUKUS, which is an alliance of Australia, the UK and the US, AUK, US, is stepping up to challenge Russia. Here's a report. In March, the Russian military had released a video. It was of a missile strike. Moscow said it struck a Ukrainian weapons depot. What came next shocked the world. The armed forces of the Russian Federation continue to conduct a special military operation. On 18th March, the Kinzhal aviation missile system with hypersonic aeroballistic missiles destroyed a large underground warehouse of the Ukrainian armed forces, containing missiles and aviation ammunition in the village of Delyatin in the Ivano-Frankivsk region. Was this the first time that Russia had used a hypersonic weapon? Moscow won't confirm if a hypersonic missile was indeed used in this attack. But Russian officials claim they have used the weapon more than once. Now the West is responding to these developments. The United States, the United Kingdom and Australia have a plan. These three countries make up the group called AUKUS. They came together last year to build nuclear submarines. Now AUKUS says it will build hypersonic weapons too. Now, what we've announced overnight is that uh, hypersonics and uh, the various technologies that surround hypersonics um, are very much a part of what the AUKUS partnership is, is striving to deliver. Not just in Australia, but in the United States and the United Kingdom as well. AUKUS will develop ultra-fast missiles. They travel at five times the speed of sound. Hypersonic missiles can hit targets anywhere on Earth. That too, within an hour. Australia wants these missiles in its arsenal. They can be deployed on land as well as Australian fighter jets and warships. These are cutting-edge weapons and world powers are in a race to get them. Russia seems to be ahead in the race. But other major powers are not too far behind. This week, the United States tested a hypersonic cruise missile. It was made by Lockheed Martin, one of America's biggest weapon contractors. This is America's second hypersonic weapons test. The US also has a separate program with Australia. It's called Sci-Fire. The objective remains the same, the development and deployment of hypersonic weapons. China is in the race too. Last year, it conducted its own hypersonic missile test. The missile circled the world before speeding towards its target. 
the test had caught American intelligence by surprise. Now the US and its allies are catching up. And China isn't too thrilled with the idea. The US, UK and Australia will cooperate in developing hypersonic weapons and other advanced military technology. This will not only increase the risk of nuclear proliferation and impact the international non-proliferation system, but also further aggravate the arms race and undermine peace and stability in Asia-Pacific region. The regional countries should remain highly vigilant to this. AUKUS believes the only acceptable response is to develop their very own hypersonic weapons. Countries like France, Germany, Japan and India are also actively working on the technology. Moral of the story, hypersonic weapons are here to stay. The developments in Ukraine will only accelerate their development. Now, before we wrap up for the evening, I have a question for you, a rather simple one, actually. How many hours of sleep do you get every night? Between six to nine, I'm guessing. An average South Korean sleeps just 6.3 hours a night. South Korea has become one of the most sleep-deprived nations in the world. May not look like it from a distance. To the world, South Korea seems like a country that is serious about its sleep routine, you know, like the models promoting K-beauty. It appears to be a country that eats healthy, like the actors in K-drama. Forget being sleep-deprived, from a distance, South Korea appears to be full of energy, like the K-pop singers or the singer of Gangnam Style. In reality, the Gangnam district of Seoul is lined with sleep clinics. Some patients coming into these clinics take up to 20 sleeping pills a night, 2-0. In reality, South Korea, we are told, is full of insomniacs. Reports say many South Koreans have resorted to alcohol because they are desperate to sleep. Many sleepwalk. There have reportedly been accidents in downtown Seoul because someone was sleepwalking. So what really is going on in South Korea? Hypo-arousal, say experts. South Koreans are struggling to sleep because they have spent decades staying awake, burning the midnight oil, working day and night to put their country on the map. It's actually a very interesting story. Think about South Korea in 1953, the year when the Korean War armistice was signed. South Korea was far from a major player in the world. It was, in fact, among the world's poorer countries. Today, it is among the world's top 10 economies. So how did South Korea make this climb in just a few decades? South Korea was not blessed with oil like Saudi Arabia. It did not have wealth like Russia or gas to tap into. South Korea harnessed its human resources. It encouraged people to work hard, study harder, innovate. The drill continued for decades and it worked wonders for the country. Today, South Korea is one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. It is home to some of the world's most valuable brands, the likes of Samsung, Hyundai, LG, Kia, POSCO. Today, South Korea also wields considerable soft power. South Korean movies are winning hearts and accolades at Oscars. K-pop and BTS are playing at every club and corner of the world. K-drama has become a rage among people of all age groups. K-beauty is taking the world by storm. And how can we forget Korean food and kimchi? South Korea is at the top of its game, but this journey to the top has exhausted its population. Today, South Koreans spend more hours at work than people in any other developed country. Some studies say the number is close to two, 2,069 hours spent at work per year. 2,069. It is not unusual for South Koreans to work 14 hours a day. So where is the time left for sleep? Reports say people in South Korea want to sleep seven and a half hours a night, but their bodies have been programmed to stay up. And they're trying everything from apps to alcohol to medicines. Reports also say that an estimated 100,000 South Koreans are addicted to sleeping pills. The country also has the highest hard liquor consumption. South Koreans drink 13.7 shots of liquor every week. How many of you knew that? A whole industry has sprung up to cater to South Korea's desperation for sleep. You will find sleep-inducing pillows in Seoul, even bed sheets designed to make you sleepy. Do any of them really work? Well, we don't know. But what we do know is that the South Korean sleep industry is raking in billions of dollars. As of 2019, it was worth two and a half billion dollars. There are retreats in South Korea that help the sleep deprived de-stress and sleep. The situation is that bad. 
But somehow, for the longest time, sleeplessness was associated with Japan, or for that matter, even India. Somehow, we managed to look through South Korea's story. Even when it was all unfolding right before our eyes, the world took notice of the sudden rise of South Korea. It discussed how Seoul managed to market its culture so well, even deliberated on how the two Koreas were so different. They went such different directions since the armistice. But no one saw this sleeplessness epidemic coming. South Korea is a classic case of how the world often takes notice of success but fails to pay attention to the struggle to the top. Think about it. We are wrapping the show, leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.